are experimentation and risk important in business? Here's why. The current of the river of life will always try and pull you towards the middle, towards complacency and mediocrity. And whether or not you disdain that personally, I don't like it, but professionally, here's the problem with that. Other companies who don't give into that current and who don't wind up in the middle will eclipse you. Because the catch 22 is companies and organizations tend to be comfortable with the tried and the true, but the audience and your customers want the new and the different. So the only tools, the best tools you have for swimming against that current of mediocrity are experimentation and risk and taking chances. And you have to do it to grow and to become a great company. You can become an okay company by not doing it, but if you wanna be great, you gotta take a shot. How can businesses then foster an innovative culture in their workplace? I think innovation takes a little bit of being nuts. I think being a little crazy or being a little nuts is very, very helpful for innovation. So I'll give you a story from my own background. I became very, very lucky and became head of an independent film studio when I was very, very young. And we were sort of the Netflix of the day. We had to make like 70, 80 movies a year. And mostly we made horror movies and action movies and very, you know, fun commercial stuff. But along comes this movie called Platoon. And I wanted to co-finance and co-produce with another studio, Platoon. And this was not at all our format. I mean, the, the, the people in it became stars, but they weren't stars. It was a very serious topic of the Vietnam War. But to his incredible credit, my boss, who was a great disruptive entrepreneur said, okay, you're head of production. You wanna do it, you can do it. But here's the thing, you bet your job. If it fails, you're fired. What do you wanna do? So <laughs> being young and stupid or smart and whatever, I took the shot. And I saw the movie, uh, one early morning at a film festival in Italy where it was just finished and they showed me the cut. And I think I'm the only person who ever laughed their way through the first screening of Platoon thinking, oh my God, I'm not getting fired. It's great, it's great, it's great. <laughs> and so Platoon goes on to win best picture of the year at the Oscars. A few years later, I ran into the director at a bar in New York one night. And he said to me, you know, kid, I always like you. You have a touch of the madness. And I always thought that's it, a touch of the madness. That's what you need. That's what I look for in actors. That's what I look for in employees. That's what I try and foster in myself. That's what I think companies have to foster in their environment, the way my boss and that director. And at that time, we had a culture of a touch of the madness. You wanna go make a movie with a bunch of unknowns about the Vietnam War? Okay, here's your shot, but you gotta gamble. Touch of the madness is the way to do it. And so as a producer, you have raised over $1 billion for the film business. What advice do you have for business leaders who also need to generate investment? You know, I think the thing that I find that's other than the usual, never give up, be relentless and so forth, is call everybody and anybody. You never know where it's going to come from. If I had a phenomenal uh, professor at Cornell in my undergrad who taught me, you can call anybody in the world. And I've been doing it ever since. All kinds of people I just call up to me. And even at, when I went to grad school at Wharton, we had to do a I was doing a paper on Warner Brothers for my thesis. So I just called the chairman of Warner Brothers. I said, I'm a student at Wharton. He called me back. We spoke for an hour. He was so great that I actually used my student loan to buy stock in Warner Brothers, which is I don't recommend doing, but fortunately it worked out. But the point is you can call anybody. And if we were to do a kind of regression analysis on all the deals we've done, 50% come from the normal sources, you know, great investment bankers, great lawyers, and so forth. 50% come from who the hell knows? So whether it's that person sitting next to you on a plane or someone you think, gee, I'd love to meet so-and-so, call anybody and everybody because you never know where it's going to come from. Mm. So what if they laugh at you? I mean, what do you know? What, what, what's going to happen? Mm. This guy won't fall in. People laugh at me all the time. People still laugh at me. I don't care. How did you break into the film industry? I was a knew I wanted to be a movie producer since I was a little kid. I walked around Boston where I grew up saying to my parents, I'm gonna go to Hollywood and be a movie producer when I was really a little kid. But how to do it? I had wonderful parents, but we didn't have a lot of money and no connections. And so in Boston, there's an unusual school, a high school, um, which is the oldest high school in America. Benjamin Franklin went there and it acts like a private school, but it's not. You have to, if you take a test and get in, you can go for free. And it's a little far away from where I live, but, and it's, it's in a sense, it's not fun. It's like going to school in 1872. It's a very strict old school, but it has, and I think still has a great track record in getting kids into good colleges. So from the time I was a little, little kid, you have to think, I'm gonna take a test. I'm gonna get into Boston Latin. I'm gonna get into Boston Latin. I did. And then from Boston Latin, 
I went to Cornell and I went to Wharton and at Cornell and Wharton, I did internship after internship after internship, figuring I would just somehow meet the right people. And the internship I had the summer of my two years between um, uh, years at Wharton was in the film department of HBO. And when I graduated from HBO, I had two offers. I mean, when I graduated from Wharton, I had two offers. One was to go work at HBO and the other was to go work at this independent startup film studio named Vestron, started by a guy who had left HBO. <laughs> And I really didn't know what to do, but it was my boss at HBO who said, you have to go work here because at HBO, we'd love to have you, but you're going to be in a cubicle for seven years. There you will get, it, it's a risk and it's an experiment, but you will get hands-on filmmaking day one. And thank goodness I went to Vestron and uh, the first thing we did was making Michael Jackson's thriller. So <laughs> it worked. So throughout that process then, can you describe um, an experience throughout your filmmaking career where you maybe faced failure and how did you overcome the challenge? You know, you face failure in the film business all the time. You just don't sit around cavalierly and chat about it in interviews at the Cannes Film Festival. But I think the important thing is what you do with it, like what happens afterwards. And the tendency when you fail is to kind of, you know, retreat. Uh, go smaller, try something uh, less ambitious the next time. Um, you know, Premier Magazine once called me wildly over ambitious, and I take a little bit of happiness and know, no, <laughs> take a little bit of short and short and void knowing there's no more Premier Magazine. But, um, and, and so you, you tend to think, well, maybe I shouldn't do. But I found when you fail and your tendency is to go smaller, do the opposite and go bigger. So that company Vestron I worked for was a fantastic, fantastic company. I worked for six years and the company wound up going bankrupt. It's a long story why, and they were later vindicated and it wasn't me, but it, it happened. And you know, it was our, our place, our first place. The next movie I made after that, and we, never, we made hundreds of movies, but none of them over $10 million. The next movie I made after that was Terminator 2, which was the most expensive movie in history at the time. And then during the financial crisis of whatever, 12 years ago, we had a movie that just went down in the middle of the, production, the financial crisis hit and our financiers left. So now it's, it's over, I'm trying to think, how can I go make another movie? And I decided well, rather than raising money for one, I'll raise money for a slate of 12. And that worked. So my best advice when you hit failure is go bigger, not smaller. Is if you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? Be still and know. So here's what that means. Um, and I'll give you the, how I got to that. So I used to think that when there was a problem, you just simply yell louder, worry more, be more frantic, stay up all night and solve the problem. And in a sense, it works. You don't feel so great about it. People around you don't feel so great about it. And, you know, eventually maybe you run out of it. But I used to think that was the way to do it. And I mentioned how I call people I'm interested in meeting. Several years ago, for our Mortal Kombat movies, I... I found a, a Zen master, a Zen Buddhist monk named Thich Nhat Hanh. He's very, very well known. And I called him up because I thought he'd be good inspiration for one of our characters in Mortal Kombat. And I went to see him for that. But two hours into went, going to see him and all his, and some of his monks, they live in France, but they were in California. I felt like I'd been on vacation for two weeks. And I said, what's your secret? And he said, no secret, practice. And I said, I can learn this. And we became friends. And I actually wound up making a documentary about them a few years ago. But one of the things he taught me was that. He said, be still and know. Because I asked him this question. I said, I get a lot done, but I'm frantic and I'm yelling all the time. And his analogy is this. Imagine a mountain lake, an alpine lake, in a beautiful mountain setting. If the water is all agitated, it won't reflect the mountaintops and the snow-capped mountains and the clouds in the sky correctly. And if you're using that as your insight into the world, you'll make a mistake. But if you calm that lake, and it's like glass. It will reflect the mountains and the clouds and the snow caps perfectly. And then you can see. So actually by calming yourself, which I used to think was, you can't do this. Not only do you feel better and do the people around you feel better, but you actually get more insight and you see the answer better and you make better decisions. So now, you know, you, you were talking at the beginning about some franticness on movies and stuff. Now when that happens, where I used to just react by yelling, I take my dog and go for a walk on the beach. 